Hello everyone, uh, happy Thursday as normal. Um, so we will be going through another hour of Capture One, um, hopefully. Um, so welcome to everyone that's online. Um, for those of you that have been here before, most of you, uh, well, I know where most of you are, which is a bit strange. Um, so hello everyone that's in, where are we? US, uh, Australia, all over Asia, uh, all over Europe, uh, UK. Okay, cool. So. Um, loads of people online, um, loads of people. In fact, Tim has made it for the first time live. So there you go. Um, you get a special shout out. Let's begin. Um, so today's session, we've got an hour as normal of editing in Capture One. Um, we're going to be using, as you would expect, the latest version, uh, which is version 21. Um, there's actually been an update to version 21. It came out about a day after the launch. Um, it's got a few bug fixes in there. Um, hopefully that fixes a lot of the problems that people were having. Um, a couple of little niggles um, from the beginning. So do make sure you're on the latest, latest version if you are on version 21. If you're not on version 21, then if you've got a subscription to Capture One, you can update whenever you're ready. Um, that's part of the deal with a subscription that you can do that. If you don't have a subscri subscription and you have a perpetual license, then go onto your account in Capture One. Um, you'll see the upgrade options if you want to. Some people are choosing to stay on version 20. There's no law that says you have to always be on the version that's uh, the, the latest. Um, and see what the see what the price options are. Um, for those people that don't have Capture One at all, and are just having a look, so tuning in to have a look at what you can do, um, go to CaptureOne.com. You can download a free trial. Um, that trial works for, well, 30 days with no restrictions. There's no limit to it. Um, obviously, after that, you've got to make the decision. Do you want to carry on using the software or export everything um, and move on? Right. Uh, so before we get anywhere further, we're also going to talk um, version 21. This is not a session that's going to review version 21, just like last week's wasn't. If you want to see the latest changes in version 21, go on to the YouTube channel. You will find this video, uh, which is the features and updates video for version 21. Uh, watch it. It's about 20 minutes. covers everything you need to know. And from there, you can make a decision as to uh, whether or not you want to take the jump. So in version 21, which isn't very different to version 20 in terms of interface. So um, version 21 itself, most of the stuff that we're going to show you in this session is going to be applicable to version 20 um, and 20.1. And to a large extent, even version 12 um, will cover a lot of this stuff. OK, so let's have a little look at this image. So this shot from Graham, um, this actually came in as part of the Facebook group um, that we have. Um, and the question was why in, and I don't want to get it wrong, raw therapy, which is this one. I think that's right, raw therapy. But we'll, we'll, I'll uh, stand to be corrected if I got it wrong. Um, why in this shot is it so much cleaner and clearer, especially in the mid-tones, than the Capture One version? So this is the Capture One version at the top. And this is the export from his alternative raw processor. I've got to be honest, I haven't used that um, piece of software, so I don't know what's in here in terms of the detail. But the areas that Graham was worried about was, let's take, for instance, one of the sheep. So I'm going to go right into 400%. And what we've got in the raw therapy, I think it is, um, version or the RT version, let's stick to that. Um, if I move my mouse over this sheep, we can see we're at, uh, look at the top numbers up here, uh, 186 in terms of luminosity. So not overexposed, not too worrying, um, sort of grey. It's funny, we always worry about making sure that sheep are white. Sheep aren't white, they're grey, they're brown, they're covered in mud and stuff like that in the field. So please don't make your sheep bright white, um, it just looks weird. So um, the sheep in this case, on that sort of highlight area there, is 188 in luminosity. Let's go on to the Capture One version that uh, Graham sent in. And that same sheep is up here at 237, 238, 23, or 241. I just saw flash up there as well. So what confused me in, in Graham's original question was he was talking about the mid-tones are clipping. Um, now, mid-tones don't clip. By nature, they are in the middle of the histogram. So the histogram, and let's just switch across to our histogram tab up here on the left. So if I were looking at things that are clipping, well, it's highlights up here. And shadows can be underexposed. So effectively, you can well clip a shadow, I guess. Um, so it's below the value of zero, which is the, the lowest visible value that we can have. Or I can clip a highlight, which is above the level of 255. So in other words, it's got no more data. Um, and it's not physically possible to, to see anything in there other than bright white. But a mid-tone can't clip because it's in the middle. That's the whole point. 
So the first thing I've done um, in terms of the, the edit that Graham sent in was just get back to the original raw because I can't see what changes were made in RT, but I can see what changes were made in Capture One, which is great because what Graham sent in is the EIP, so I can see the layers and everything that's been adjusted. And the first thing I'm going to do is put on our before and after. In fact, let's just do something quickly different. Uh, let's go down to this sheet here, and I'm going to add up here a color readout. So some people have got um, shortcuts on their keyboards to do that. Um, I do. I have the little um, quote and the backslash to add and delete. But I can, whereas I can use my mouse over the top and this will give me a live readout, I can put a fixed readout in place. So that will now not move as I move around the image. And that will give me that readout as we're changing things. So let's have a little look at the before image. And quite rightly, as Graham said, the sheep is a mid-tone. So it's at 116. That's the luminosity readout there. But after editing... It leaps up to 228, so it becomes a highlight and actually almost to the point of has it clipped. So then let's look at the adjustments that are on here. So we've got a mid-tone there and a highlight there. And also, in fact, before we go into trying to fix the sheep, as it were, let's look out here at this tree. So again, let's look at the, uh, in fact, let's do a quick comparison. So I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to choose the other version from the other editor. And at the same time, I'm going to hold down the shift key, which means that when I zoom into the right hand image, it also zooms into the left. There's a little bit of misalignment because of the crop. But one of the other things that um, Graham mentioned was the sort of over sharpness effectively. So the, the, the patterning and um, and it's been it looks over processed on the left and the left one is his um, capture one version. The right one is the version that came out of RT. Well, the reason it looks over processed is because it has been. Um, and that's that's the challenge. So if I go back to the raw, we don't have these harsh lines, we don't have these clips, we don't have anything like that. The before and after on the right hand side is not going to change, it's a TIFF file, it's a flattened version, I don't know what adjustments were made in the previous one. But on the one in Capture One, for sure on the left hand side, I can see that something has gone wrong here. So let's start deconstructing, let's go back into our Capture One image. So the first thing is the sharpening. Now we've got a lot of halos around these high contrast points. Now let's look at what's on our sharpening tab. This is quite high. This is at 488 and I don't think it needs to be. So if we pull this back and the defaults normally between 100 and 200, something like that, when it comes in with a lens profile, if I pull that back, just that sharpening alone makes a big difference. So let me just undo that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone this variant so we can see uh, exactly what the changes are. So let's pull this sharpening back on this shot. Now, while at the moment that looks a little bit blurry, we're at 400%. So let's get back out to 100% and I'm perfectly sharp. It's no different. The difference is on our previous one, this is overdone. Um, and that's why we're getting these weird sort of halos and artifacts around it. In fact, we could even dial it back a little bit less and it's not going to make any difference when we produce something for print. Let's go back out to 100%. Nice and sharp. It's all good. So that's the, the haloing and the sharpening and, and why we're getting some weird clips around the, the tree. Now let's go back to our sheep, our little identified sheep down here. Uh, and as someone's just said, uh, where are we? Search so just said, uh, Sean, the sheep is white. Yes, you're right. Cartoon sheep are white. Um, but in reality, unfortunately, they're not. Sheep just get dirty. They're, they're, uh, they're off white at best. So let's look at the sheep here. And we're at 227 um, in terms of luminosity. I'm going to put my before and after option on. So I can see before, which was at 116, and after at 227. That's a very big jump that's happened in those two um, um, differences. So where's the jump come from? Well, actually, it's come from two different places. The first is this exposure. So the exposure has been pushed by two and a half stops. It doesn't sound a lot, but two and a half stops in real life is six times more light. So I believe, and I, I, I'm sort of in a place of let's just reset all of these adjustments on the raw. The reason for doing that was because this bit down the bottom just looked a little bit, um, a little bit dark, a little bit dim and so on. So the idea was to brighten up the whole area. But the problem is by brightening up the area to the point where all of this stuff here is more visible and more interesting. Everything that was already on the slight high side of the highlights area up here in the histogram has also shifted a huge amount too, by two and a half stops, quite a lot. 
So instead of doing it with our exposure, I'm going to pull this all the way back down. And as I do that, you'll see this readout change. Um, so our sheep has gone back down to 160. In fact, I'm going to probably pull us down to about one and a half stops, no more than that. The second thing, and in fact, on top of the exposure change, was also this levels change as well. So that's pulling the histogram and stretching it even further. Now, we can afford to do that a little bit here just to bring the overall um, feel of the image to be a bit more contrasty, so stretch that histogram a bit more, which is different to an exposure change. An exposure change takes the histogram and it literally shifts it right to left. The um, levels option doesn't, it stretches that histogram, so it's adding more contrast and it's making the darks darker, the brights brighter, and you can choose the ratio that you mix it with this middle bar here. So I've undone some of the exposure and I've added on a little bit more of levels so we still have a relatively bright feeling to it but our sheep our happy little sheep is now not overexposed and over overdone and blown out so on top of all of that let's look at what we can do locally because if we still want it to look quite bright and there or bright and, uh, and light then we can do that but we can do it selectively so what we can do is we can add a new layer. Let's call that one foreground. Oh, foreground. It's an unhappy foreground. Um, let's put on a gradient, and I'm going to put a very soft gradient in that sort of tails off up to here. So this is my gradient here. It's going to affect everything that's red. And as it moves up to this point, it's going to have less of an effect, and up to that point, even less of an effect to zero up here. But it kind of doesn't matter because with this layer, all I'm going to be pulling up is our shadows. So even though that, that gradient actually goes into the sky, all I'm pulling up is shadow. But what I am going to do is just add a tiny little touch of clarity into that layer as well, just to give it a little bit of punch. Okay, on top of that, let's now put another one in. Well, in fact, I think actually from memory, Graham School, yeah, so that we've already got a sky version here. So this sky is designed to pull down the highlights. Well, the reason we had to pull down the highlights in Graham's layer was because the original image had the ex or its exposure lifted so high that actually you've got to almost unburn and unclip um, some of those highlights. So we can reduce the impact of this layer to almost nothing, actually, and we could even pull back some of this exposure. So we get to a place where, you know, don't get me wrong, the sheep is still, to my mind, probably a little bit bright. This is the original at 228. Here we bring it up to 214. We could afford, if we wanted to, now we've lifted the sky to pull this, um, sorry, pull our exposure down just a touch more, down to maybe 207. And we don't get that same clipping effect um, as we do here. So I'm in a place where, I, for whatever reason, this, this is the RT version or the, the raw thingy the raw thingy um this is the raw, the rt version which i agree um looks a bit cleaner than the version that came out of capture one originally um so here's our capture one version a little bit overexposed a little bit over bright let's look at this tree it's overdone compared to the rt version some of this information out here is missing a bit but if i tone everything back a little bit and just pull back on the exposure pull back on the levels pull back on some of the hdr stuff what I get to very quickly is something that's very similar to that RT. In fact, in my view, it's probably a little more interesting because we've got a bit more contrast in that tree compared to the backside. But that's sort of where I get to um, in terms of producing that image um, on its own. Now, uh, where are we? Oh, I just saw that pop up from Brian there. So would a sheep, would a sheep layer, we're at that level. So would a sheep layer dropping the highlights work yes it would um so if we look around in general um all over this bottom oops, sorry bottom part of the image down here um we've got all of this stuff down here which is a 80s 90s 100 stuff like that nothing's really up here up in the 200s apart from those sheep so here's another cool one we could create a new layer called sheep what we could do is we could let's just make sure my flow is up to 100 i'm going to just cover this layer where all the sheep are and you can probably guess what we're going to do because i'm being very rough with the mask but with that mask i'm going to click on luma range tell it to display the mask 
I'm going to tell it to get everything up here. Now, we know the highlights in this sheep are at 207, so let's go a little bit lower than that just to make sure we get a bit more. And we'll have a nice soft fall off and a soft radius. So now if you look carefully, we've got all the sheep masked. Just the brights, the highlights in those sheep. And with that mask, let me turn the mask off. I can pull down whites and down highlights to recover them a little bit more. So it's not going to have a massive impact, but it is going to help that recovery just a touch. Okay, so I think the question originally from Graham, and, and actually looking at the two in comparison, it's it's a fair call, which is the one that came out of uh, this alternative software looked a bit cleaner, a bit more natural um, compared to the original one that was sent in. But I'm sort of in a place where some of that was because a lot of those sliders are overdone. If we pull things down just a touch, um, we get the the tree without all of that haloing and without any blown clip stuff all of the the clip stuff on the edges of the trees that you were seeing was just the result of over sharpening so when you over sharpen something you end up with a halo around those dark and light contrast points those halos end up effectively clipping because to make a sharp um, edge capture one actually adds a bright area and a dark area um, either side of it to give you the perception of improved sharpness. You can't actually sharpen an image. You can give the perception of sharpness, um, but that's it. So the tree is fixed. Um, the sheep are no longer at 228. We're down at 204. We could push that down a bit more if we wanted to. But if I want to make this image feel just as light as it did before, well, with the sky, I can pull our exposure up a touch. And with our foreground, I can, if I want to, pull our shadows up a bit as well. Could even introduce some saturation just to give it a bit more richness. Now, as you do that, you're going to get this sheep increasing a little bit too. Um, so we want to be careful. Maybe we just pull up a little bit of black to the very bottom end of those highlights. Keep it back down um, to 207. Um, and there we've got uh, everything looking a bit big, oh, a little bit better. Sorry. Yeah. Tongue tied. Okay. A uh, couple of uh, questions. So Earl saying, I wouldn't care if the sheep are clipped. Um, yeah. <laughs> Smart. Cool. Um, so uh, maybe you're saying dehaze could also cause the sharpness and the distance or create. Yeah. So if we wanted to, in, in 21, obviously you've got the dehaze slider. We can do it in an alternative way. Um, but for the sake of speed, let's just add in an extra little layer. Um, and I would encourage you to do dehaze in moderation always and then let's just do that there and let's just slide up our dehaze a touch there we go um, and we end up with a lot more detail in the background too so with a few extra steps and more importantly with local adjustments rather than just a global one um, you get to a place where you know that was the original that you sent in um, this is where i get to with a few different layers and this is the one from that RT software. Um, so the original um, premise was that the RT does a better job um, than what we could do in Capture One. I think with some more selective adjustments, you can get to actually a better place. Um, but it might take a bit more time. Um, and that's where we uh, that's where we get to. Okay, so that's uh, that's Graham's shot. Let's move across to one from Jens. Uh, oh, let's just get rid of that color readout. It's going to be annoying. Okay, so the question, that this is actually a, an image that was sent in quite a while ago, so sorry about that, Jens. Um, the question that came in with this one was about sharpness. Now, it's a, it's a nice shot. It's composed nicely. Um, we're at F4, a 200th of a second. Um, it's a long shot. Um, I'm not sure, actually, if we have the lens data. 135 mil. Okay. Um, so you know let me just uh, i'm actually going to show you let's create a new variant so this is the original shot um and the question was you know can we give it more presence can we make it sharper the answer is no um it was shot through fog um the focus isn't quite right on this person i can't quite find the exact focal point part of that's because of the fog but what we do have as a result of waiting um a little while to edit this picture is a bit of fun with the dehaze tool why not um, let's just do it on the background and see what we get. So, out of the blocks with one click, you notice I didn't even choose a shadow tone. Um, out of the blocks with one click, we've got an improvement. Now, of course, we could do this a lot more refined if we wanted to. We could draw some masks in here. 
we could change those levels uh, we could do a lot of work in this to make it even clearer and even punchier but then I get into a, a bit of a problem which is I quite like it as it is um, and you've done the keystone corrections you've done everything um, frankly you've done everything right with it um, it's just a bit of a shame that this person isn't quite the um, quite the subject that it could be we can fix that now um, let's just show you with a little extra dehaze function so I'm just going to go to my brush make sure we've got a really really soft edge and I'm going to go back to my old old ways of opacity um, and I'm just going to softly add more and more mask over the guy on the bike and then effectively hand feather that mask out to the edges we might need a little bit in this one too okay so with that mask turned off what we can now try is using that dehaze tool just on there and i think that does work so it does give us a bit more presence about him if i if i or him or her can't actually work out um, which it is but we go from there to there yeah i think that's probably a bit of an improvement the second and actually just like when we were talking about with graham's shot the second we start adding too much sharpening so let's go into let's we've, we've got him selected so let's use him um, or her um, if i start adding extra sharpening what you're going to get and i hope you can see this on the screens um, what you're going to get is this really harsh um, line setup with with random halos and an extra noise dragged up and whatever this shot has been pulled quite away already it's quite a lot of noise in there it's been sharpened to the point where we don't see some of the blurriness in it if you pull sharpening too much you're going to overwork it so i would be tempted although it's not perfect um, in terms of the focus on on the cyclist i wouldn't push it too much more um, i'd be tempted to leave it where it is the only thing i would recommend if you really wanted to push a tiny bit um, further is with this dehaze um, area here so we've masked um, over here specifically we can pull up a touch of structure but really careful no more than 10 in this case and a bit of clarity just to help um, define some of those areas a bit more but that's where i'd leave it genuinely um, so the only change we've made is actually adding this layer it helps because it keeps that richness all the way through and certainly it's a bit easier than than this one but i actually it's going to sound weird i like the color in the original as well i like what you've done with it um but i think you're right on that limit of not trying to be um not trying to push it too far if you try and push it much more than where we've gone to already i think you're going to end up with an image that starts to have artifacts and things that ruin it rather than things that make it better right um oh Jens has just said the guy came as a surprise i think the focus is on one of the pillars yeah it's always a way um and i tell you i guarantee if you if you decided right this is clearly going to be a good shot i'll now wait here and wait for the next cyclist to come across two two hours later they still wouldn't have come across either um so i know it, it's one of those things where you're better again you're better off getting the shot um than not and and i think actually it it's done well um it's it's as good as you're probably going to get out of that shot um, I do like these tones. I'd be interested to see if you did the same thing and we deconstruct it with the uh, with the other tones as well. Right, um, where are we, Brian? Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, the, as a general rule, so looking at Brian's comment about dehaze, um, as a general rule, just remember what makes this shot, and actually we've used dehaze just to add a bit of clarity to that subject, but what makes this shot is the atmosphere. It is the fog let's not get into that mode of trying to remove fear or fog and mist and everything from everything um, because we don't want a world that is completely clear we want we want atmosphere in there um vernon said the muted colors work well I, I agree and actually you've got a few different versions that Yent sent in so we've got the black and white version um this is the original this is another one with the original colors um this is the one that i think you settled on but again um if we don't like that let's just create a clone if we go back to our shot white balance then we get a much cooler version of it as well so we end up with these two as options i think adding in a bit more richness into the middle helps um but don't push it much more than that um where are we barry's just asked what are my thoughts on capture one doing a major overhaul on the keystone tool um i find it cumbersome 
Uh, yes. So what are my thoughts? I think it's about time the Keystone tool got a major overhaul. Agreed. Um, and actually, some in, in some ways, um, when I'm shooting either from rooftops or, or even, even actually from below and shooting up to a city, um, there are a few things I'd like to see in the Keystone tool. I'd like the auto zoom stuff. I'd like actually for it to be live preview. So in other words, as I'm stretching things, I see the effect that it's having rather than moving lines and then um, clicking the button. Um, but I've already fed some of that back in. I would hope that everyone else is feeding some of that back in so we can get a bit of gravity behind the idea um, and hopefully see that feature um, tweaked and improved long term. Um, where are we? Uh, Claudius just said you can't fight fog in terms of sharpness. Yeah, absolutely. So, And, and this is why I'm saying you get very quickly to being on the edge of, of where you can go with it. As you start to um, add in clarity and structure and sharpness and all of the artificial tools we have, and they're, they're good tools, um, as you add those in, every single one of them, remember that golden rule, every single slider you should only touch if you need it because every slider risks your image quality. And in this case, we're using a lot of sliders, a lot of tools to try and um, shore things up you'll get to the edge of where it starts to um, degrade and stop there. <laughs> don't, don't go any further. Okay, um, let's have a little look at another shot. Um, so this was one from Steve. Uh, there's a few from Steve actually, but um, this one, I'm just going to touch on it um, because I'm going to then come across to, we're going to do some pano stitching just for fun. Um, and talk about some of the limitations and, and fun and games that go with it. But with this shot here from Steve, um, it's it's processed really nicely. So again, Steve sent in the EIP, which helps me because I can see um, all the things that have happened on the shot. We've got rid of some stuff uh, on the water. We've got a little bit of color richness in here. Um, and I'm going to say genuinely, there's not a lot I would change in this shot. There are a couple of little tweaks. So one, when I had a look, if I do a slight straightening tool, we ended up with a tiny little twist. I can't remember what it was, but it sort of went a little bit, oh, sorry, a little bit the other way um, when I did it. But it's, minor, it's tiny, 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 oh, tiny minor. The only thing that I got to, and this is a personal preference, um, was changing the crop ratio. So at the moment, this is four by three. I'd be tempted to do two by three. Um, simply because I can still come up here to that tree, but it just feels more immersive. The, the, the tighter the crop, when especially when it comes to something like a, a, a building on a lake, you know, the subject isn't the lake itself. I don't need the grand vista. I don't need the top and bottom so much. I don't need all of that sky up there and all the water down below. And that two by three crop is a slight panoramic. It's obviously not um, two by one or anything like that. Um, but to me, that shift across to, to a slightly wider proportion gives me something a little bit extra. Um, and I like the fact that it's it's a bit tighter when we do that. Um, otherwise, honestly, um, and this is going to it's going to sound like a bit of a cop out. But if I go before and after on this one, it's a nice, um, sympathetic um, edit to the shot. I don't see any halos. I don't see any um, high sharpness areas. I don't see any issues with over clarity or, or changing white balance too much. What I do see is a lot of detail recovery, which is nice out here. Um, it's done really well. So genuinely, Steve, it's a nice shot. Cool. Get it printed. Get it on a wall. Um, let's uh, we'll come back to bills in a second. because I just want to spend a little bit of time on pano stuff. So um, Graham's shot. Hopefully we fixed um, that challenge. Jens's shot. Hopefully we, we've talked enough about sort of getting to that point and not going much further, but there is something you can do with a bit of dehaze and a bit of clarity just to improve um, the richness of your subject. And Steve's shot, you know, personally, it's just a crop thing, um, but there's there's not a lot more I would change with that. It's a really nice shot. Right, uh, pano stitching. So as we all know, Capture One does not have the function or feature or ability to stitch multiple images together. Just turn off my before and after. Um, so this is a shot, a series of shot that, uh, shots that Barry sent in. Um, we've got a few different panos. Um, and these have obviously been taken. So one shot, the next shot, the next shot at different angles to be able to stitch together later. So what we are going to talk about today, um, whether 
it's comfortable or not is the issues with pano stitching out of capture one because it doesn't natively do pano stitching so a couple of things are a challenge the first what we've got to bear in mind is we're going to overlap some images so we're going to have to go out to an external editor i'm going to show you two actually today that we can use and we have to overlap those images and we have to get them overlapping in a way where the joins are not obvious and not visible now without being able to line all these up together and, and place them um, in front of you it's very difficult to make certain decisions without being able to visualize what's going to happen so let me explain what i mean by that it may be that in the complete panoramic um, set i want a vignette so i want a curved gradient over the sky so higher at the middle and then as it comes down towards the edges it gets lower and lower well i can't do that on the individual images well i could but oh wow that's a lot of work so we've got to bear in mind the limitations that we have in the individual images versus the panoramic and then take it into an external editor and it may be there that we need to do some more tweaks for now so as it stands we don't have the option to do this in capture one but we do have the option still to use it as our raw processor and then put it into an external application to do the stitching so if we bear in mind the sort of i guess second golden rule um, as it were is especially with pixel editors is do the pixel editing last now in an ideal world i would still be able to do some of the gradient stuff afterwards but let's get what we can do uh, done before we get it out to an external editor so here's our shot um nice shot of a mountain i think you said it was wales somewhere i may have got that wrong um Sorry, Barry, I can't remember. Um, I don't have the note on there, but I think it was Wales somewhere. So a few things. This is shot at f5.6, probably not diffracted. Um, if we were to enable diffraction correction, that bird's going to be interesting when we stitch. Um, are we going to sharpen anything up? Uh, no, not really. So let's leave it off. What we've got to start thinking is everything I do to one shot has to apply to all of them. So if I make lens corrections on one, I have to apply it to the others. If I make a white balance correction on one, I have to apply it to the others. Otherwise, you're going to get a mismatch when we join them. Now, beyond that, in terms of things like gradients, they have to line up. In terms of things like um, when I make a change to clarity, if I make a local change, let's say on this tree here, and I've got that same tree in another shot, I have to make a very similar at minimum um sorry barry there we go it's fraser valley canada not wales there we go i thought it was quite impressive for wales but no it's canada much better um so let's um let's have a, a think about all those components because as i go from image to image to image we've got to make sure that all of those changes line up for that reason typically we would start on a middle image so if you've got three four five six seven or whatever images you're probably going to have one side is bright one side is dark well in this case we need to edit that image as if it were a whole so the easiest way to do it is to start with one of the middle shots and use that as your base edit so in this base edit we're going to do some pretty simple pretty quick changes so number one and again think about the fact that we want uniform changes so whereas potentially i might be tempted to draw a little mask over here um let's pull that up to there and make a change to this area so i might then pull up my shadows well that's fine but what happens when i go to the image next door which still has a part of that in now i've got to remember where that mask ended try and replicate it in this image no 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 so generally speaking at the moment with, with the tools that we've got within capture one you want to be looking at global adjustments because a global adjustment i can apply to all the individual frames and then they'll stitch together nicely so in this case what was i drawing a mask over that for well i wanted to bring up the black so let's bring up the black slider and we're just gonna we're just gonna do it globally um, now we're only working on one image right now we could select all and do edit selected but instead i'm going to do one image and then we're going to apply it to all the others so that's our shadows brought up what about these highlights these whites up here so let's just move our mouse over here so we're at 228 227 they're not actually whites they're highlights so with our highlights we could pull them down just a touch again don't overdo it um 
and then we'll talk about the sky in a second but in general down here this looks pretty good i think barry you mentioned um on your email these trees do look pretty orange um or something like that so um, we'll, we'll leave them um, as they are to a certain extent what I might be tempted to do is just pull down the overall saturation or maybe even pull down the warmth so we bring the Kelvin down a little bit and also the tint just to match so we keep the blue in the sky but we just knock that um, that real sort of over warm um, feeling down um, just a bit so let's just look at our before and after before we've even done anything. And actually, the more I look at it, I prefer the overwarm feeling. So we're going to leave that up here just a touch back to where we almost were. OK, so we've got our detail here in our shadows. We've got our detail back in our clouds up here. So beforehand, we had a slight risk of clipping here. Here we don't. Really nice. Um, let's look at our sky. So at the moment, we might want to balance out our sky again. Be really careful and think about this. We're going to stitch these images together. If I create a gradient, which is on an angle, let's just get rid of our thing here, and I copy that to the next image, well, at that point that they join, the low part of image one is matching the high part of image two, and you're going to get a sawtooth effect as they go along. So again, unfortunately, when it comes to joining images together, we've got to stay global we've got to down straight so i'm holding down the shift key and use my gradients as if they're global and are going to apply to every single image for that reason it's also important that when you record your images you have your tripod level and straight which luckily barry does okay um ralph has just said wouldn't this be the perfect example of speed edit to adjust several images at once it would apart from the fact that as I'm talking you through them we're going to make global changes to everything and I might want to undo some of those changes as well um, you'll, you'll see in a second why so we have uh, our new well where are we mask up here with that mask I'm just going to pull down our exposure a touch and actually going to pull up our saturation a little bit too I might even be tempted to split tone this a little bit so we could either warm up the sky or certainly add in a little bit of tint onto it that's looking pretty nice be careful with this never ever change the sky to the point that the ground or the foreground or the reflection more importantly doesn't match i saw a picture um a couple of weeks ago which looked incredible at first um, first glance it had a stormy sky and then the the building in front was dark you looked at the reflection the building was light and the sky um, sorry the stormy sky and the building was light looked at the reflection the sky was dark oh sorry was light and the building was was the opposite it was completely dark um, just be careful if you're gonna make any changes that split the image in two yeah just be really careful okay so We've got our, our main changes done. Let's just move our before and after. So we go before to after. And all we've done basically is calm down some of the highlights in the sky and bring up some of these foreground colors and, and textures and so on. In the foreground, could we add a little bit more warmth? Maybe, but I'm tempted to leave it as it is. It's, it's pretty, pretty accurate. OK, so that's our before done. Now, I can copy these adjustments, including this layer. So we're going to call this gradient sky. So I can either Command, Shift, and C on the keyboard, or I can do my Copy, Apply option up here. So we're going to copy. I'm going to choose the other three, and we're going to go to Apply. So now, on all these other ones, they've got the exact same mask, the exact same gradient change, the exact same exposure change, um, and high dynamic range change at a uniform level, and that's the key thing. So when we want to stitch an image together in the point of capture, we want to make sure our white balance is locked. We want to make sure our exposure is locked. We want to make sure that the camera is level and we're spinning on one axis in, in broad terms. That's the idea. When it comes to editing, we want to make sure that our edits are uniform and relatively flat because as we move up and down or left and right and so on in the image, the risk is that those edits, if they're at an angle or if they're specific and local, you can't replicate them well enough on the next shot. And then you've got some blending challenges. OK, um, let's have a little look at how we get these out. So I'm going to show you two methods. The first method is probably the um, the neatest method, as it were. Um, so let's go to edit with. 
Uh, you can't quite see that, sorry. Let's just get you onto here. So edit with, and we're gonna go into Photoshop. So Photoshop, in this case, 2021. And I make my setting changes. So I can say I wanted it 100%, 16-bit, Adobe RGB, uncompressed TIFF, fine. Capture One is now gonna process those variants. And it's going to fire up Photoshop, cool. And it's gonna load them each into individual images. Really quick in Photoshop, this stuff. So file, automate, photo merge. You're gonna have a list of source files and the option that you want. You're gonna click on add open files. So that's all of those TIFFs. And you've got the choice, blend images together. If there was a vignette in the images, do you want it to remove them at the join? So, yep. Um, do we have any geometric distortion correction? Well, we've already done our distortion correction in Capture One. So if you find that there's some weird sort of bubbling that happens, and I have seen it before, then maybe get Photoshop to do it. But if you've done it right in Capture One, you shouldn't need that option. And then you've got the fun one, which is content aware, aware fill transparent areas. Personally, I wouldn't. Um, I've seen content aware fill do good things. I've also seen it create random things that were never ever in existence. So I would leave that off. And if anything, you can do it manually with aware fill later on. You can choose the layout if you want. So you can choose whether it was a, a perspective pull. So you've got um, sides and everything looking down the side of a tunnel, or you can choose whether it's just a traditional cylindrical um, or spherical um, placement of images, or let Photoshop work that out itself with auto. Click on OK. You'll see it build an image or a file with a load of different layers on it. There we go. And it has read in some information about the fact that as it went around this side, maybe it was on a wide lens um, and it's worked out what to do. OK, and let's just pull up our layers so we can see. Now, what Photoshop has actually done, and this is the clever bit, is it hasn't actually got rid of the rest of each of the images. What it's done is it's built a mask around them, and you can see. So on our first image here, it's actually masked off all of this area here because it's decided to blend it with this image, which it has masked off the other areas. And it's decided to blend that with this image and this image. So it's actually kept all four images when it's just created masks, basically, um, that bring all of these images together. Now, that can be fine as long as you don't have things that are moving, because what can happen when things are moving is you might want to take um, a part of image one and put it into image two and so on. Now, of course, in Photoshop, we can add to that mask. We can um, overwrite some of it. So uh, let's have a little look. Let's go into, let's say we wanted the cloud from this image here, not this image down here. Well, pretty easy. We're just gonna paint onto our mask rather than onto the image. And we're gonna add more of that cloud in, and then that blends over the top of the next one and so on. So we can play with those masks, we can tweak them, we can add bits from different layers over the top. But what Photoshop has done is it stretched those images geometrically to make them fit like a jigsaw piece and then design the jigsaw pieces around it. When I'm done with that, so if I save that down, it's going to save it to wherever I choose. And this is where, unfortunately, we lose a little bit of connectivity because it's going to save that into a folder. Save it with the layers, that's fine. And when I come out of Photoshop, and let's just go into our Capture One, there's our panorama. Oh, no, wait. No, there isn't. And this is the problem. And this is where this becomes disconnected. Because what Capture, sorry, what Photoshop has done is it's taken all of these TIFFs. So the individual TIFF files absolutely come from Capture One. Um, and they, they actually work out as round trip files. So you can take the round trip file out of Photoshop, oh, sorry, out of Capture One into Photoshop out of Photoshop, back into Capture One, and the edits will, be, will have changed here. What you can't do is create a new file in Photoshop in that same session and expect Capture One to know about it, which is what's happened. So unfortunately, this is the point where the round trip fails because it's created a brand new file that Capture One knows nothing about. You would have to re-import it. So we'd have to go into our importer and bring in that untitled panorama. If we do that, 
Uh, let me just move that file around a second uh, so we can do it. So I'm just creating a new window off of the screen so you can see what's happening. And let's just import that pano in. So there's our panorama. Um, when it loads up the preview, this is a bit weird. And there's our stack. So there's our panorama. So it is possible to bring it back in. We would want to do a bit of cropping and playing. So let's get onto our crop tool. Uh, let's pull this in. So we've got our nice little layout here. Uh, maybe we want to go two by one. In fact, that would make more sense as a panorama, wouldn't it? Um, so let's pull out to there. If I had done any content aware fill in the areas um, on the outside, then of course that would have come across as well in the TIFF file. But we then have our panorama stitch. So out of those one or the, the individual frames, we're able and genuinely you are able to bring it back into um, Capture One. And if we wanted to now, arguably, we could do some other stuff. So if I wanted to add a vignette, I now can because it's now in as one image. And remember, it's not the individual slices in this case. It is one image. But we're now editing a pixel file. We're not editing the raw file. And that's why I'm saying make sure most of your changes are done before bring it out into a pixel file or pixel editor rather than trying to rely on doing it when they're all um, seamlessly one piece. And yes, so Chili's um, points, this is where Capture One is clunky. Um, it should be able to monitor the folder directory. So you can if you're using sessions. So if you, you had a session, we were doing a, um, a pull in of files from there, then it could do that. In this case, we're doing a um, we're doing a catalog. Uh, and then Martin's saying, do you have to re-import if you panel stitching in a session? Yes. So ah, there we go. We're, we're ahead. So um, yes. Um, so if you're using sessions rather than catalogs, then it can bring it in. Um, and you can choose that folder to monitor um, and that way. But you'd have to do that process of re or effectively telling Capture One to look for images. You wouldn't necessarily have to drag it in or create a new folder or so on to do it, but you would have to do that. Okay, uh, Rogers just asked, might you have transformed the final version rather than cropping? Yeah, we could have done. And, and actually, this is where I come into a little bit of a sticky place because from the point that I'm in Photoshop making these changes, personally i would stick to being within photoshop um, because in there we can do some some alterations let's say to the image we can we can pinch and punch we can pull up um, and distort um, different areas of the image we can do content aware fill we can do all that stuff um, but um, if you want to round trip it and keep most of your stuff in capture one this is one of the ways to do it the other way to do it um, is let's just load up so well um, there's a bit of a problem here because we don't have quite the same interaction with it, but I'm just going to off screen load up another option, which is affinity. Um, where are we? Let's just lose that comment from Roger a second. So in affinity, I can do a new panorama now to add my images. Well, actually, what Capture One has done, as we saw, was it's created these four TIFFs anyway. So if I open those TIFF files in the right folder and say Stitch Panorama, um, then Affinity is going to be able to load that in and do its own job. Now, Affinity and um, Photoshop stitch images very differently. You can see in here, Affinity loads it up with all of the um, differences from frame to frame, and then it blends. Um, so it's a very different process to what Photoshop does. Photoshop is literally doing um, a jigsaw puzzle. Affinity does a little bit of a, in my view, smarter job of stitching panoramas. Um, and it can result in a slightly better um, output, in my view. But that's just my own view. Photoshop, I love. I've always used Photoshop for a long, long time. But in this case, um, what Affinity have done with their pano stitching just feels a bit more complete. So the process in Affinity is, is really, really click or quick. You can make those changes. You can edit the pano. You can, just like in Photoshop, you can draw in from a base image. You can erase from a base image as well um, and choose the frames that you want to use for different areas. Um, let me just actually, let's just give you a little bit of an example. So let's do that exact same panorama again. So I'm just going to add those TIFF files, go to open, say stitch panorama. And OK. Now, let's think of an example. Uh, remember this bird that was flying here? <laughs> let's just have a little look. So here's our bird. 
and obviously this bird won't have existed on all the frames so if I were to choose this frame here we've got the bird there if I go to my eraser I can erase that part of the frame or maybe it wasn't on that frame maybe I picked the wrong frame that'd be interesting uh, maybe it was on this frame so let's go to our eraser hmm This could be fun, couldn't it? Um, because if I draw... No, it is on that frame. How odd. Let's just draw in a bit more of this one into there. And the bird has moved, funnily enough. Oh, okay, so the bird was in a different place on the second frame. Right, either way we can choose which parts of which frame to take and we can erase and we can add and we can draw extra bits of frame one onto frame two and so on before we hit this apply button in affinity so if you've got for instance someone that ran through one frame and didn't exist in the second and you've got enough overlap you can delete them from um, the, the the other frames effectively in that stitch that stitch itself of course when i save it down again it's not necessarily going to bring it into Capture One unless we have a monitored folder or a session folder and so on. Or so on. We have to then, I'm not going to save this in this case, we have to then re-import or bring it in or tell Capture One um, to look out for it. So the effectively the ability to do stitching within Capture One is not there right now. The ability to round trip it out to external applications also is pretty clunky, um, but there are ways of doing it. So what I would encourage people to do is edit the raw as much as you can, but remember it needs to be uniform edits. If you start making local adjustments, if I start making changes onto this tree here, I have to make that exact same change to here and to here in all those frames that include the same piece. So be really careful with local adjustments before you're stitching something in a panorama. Once you move it into a pixel editor, so all of the panoramic um, stitching things are, are going to be um, those types of editors. Once you move it into those, you're going to lose the ability to make any raw adjustments. So make as many adjustments as you can up front. Um, Chili's just asked on sky edits on the pano, if the camera wasn't on a tripod and there was camera movement, would that cause a problem with the adjustment coverage moving out of the images? It's bigger than that problem, to be honest. I would not ever tell anyone to use a non-tripoded um, camera if you're planning on stitching the images later. It's not just about the fact that you might get the rotation wrong, but also your forward and back movement changes as well. As I take a shot here, as I turn, not only have I turned, I've also maybe pulled the camera around uh, more than I would have done if it was on one fixed axis. If you want to get really um, passionate about it, you actually need a pano head, which is going to change and move the camera around the actual nodal point that's correct for the camera rather than the back of the camera. So typically we mount our tripod to the base plate on the back, on the bottom of the back of the camera. We actually need the, the camera to move around the lens point rather than the, um, the back of it. So you can buy a head that you would mount your camera onto and it, move, it changes the, the rotational point or the axis of where the camera is moving to for a better stitch. Or you can use a shift lens. So if you're on a technical camera, you can shift your um, image circle around or the sensor around the image circle to, to stitch. I wouldn't recommend stitching handheld. Um, you're just starting off from a place where you're going to be recovering a lot of problems. Um, okay, so Brad, can we easily demonstrate the loss of fidelity in the adjustments between a 16-bit TIFF and a RAW? It's not necessarily about loss of fidelity, to be honest. So um, the 16-bit TIFF, compared to the edited RAW, will, will appear, as long as you've done your color management correctly, will appear pretty much the same. The issue is what I can change. So in the RAW file, if, for instance, I brought this pano in later and decided, huh, those shadows need pulling up a bit more because I've got some underexposed areas the raw file still contains the information beyond what's visible in that 16-bit TIFF. The 16-bit TIFF, if that pixel is zero, it has no idea what was to the left of it. It's too late. So it's not about loss of fidelity in terms of image quality. It's about the loss of flexibility later. Um, where are we? So is there a, we've got a question. Is there a new problem with hardware acceleration? Not that I'm aware of to be honest um, I've seen a couple of people on 21 talking about these rectangles that are appearing I'm not sure what the issue of that is 
Um, but yeah, just um, just keep an eye on it. But I'm, I'm sure if there is a problem, people are going to be looking at it. Um, John's just said uh, Photoshop lets you adjust the mask in the, the, the merge. Yeah, we, we showed that, John. So um, when you bring in that merge, um, you've got masks applied to every single one of the frames. The difference is that it doesn't do that extra step that Affinity seems to do, which is blending, um, where it's got enough overlap to do that. What it tends to do is jigsaw cut um, rather than uh, rather than a nicer blend, as it were. Um, where are we? Uh, Capture One can introduce a watch folder in catalogs as well. Um, so Prasad, I know you are a big fan of putting in feature requests, so put that one on your list. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the request to do that. Um, let's see if they can. Uh, the only thing with, with watch folders is you're adding extra time um, in processing terms to keep an eye on what's what's going to come on. Um, okay, and then Tim's saying, yeah, so for this kind of stuff, in my mind, I always consider it a one-way trip. Absolutely. And that's, I guess, the, the essence of what I'm trying to get across, which is if you're planning on stitching lots of images which were taken, the temptation, for example, if I'm on the right-hand side and it's overexposed, the left-hand side is underexposed, the temptation is to tweak the exposure from right to left. The problem with that is you're going to have this sort of waviness that appears as, as your pixel editor tries to merge all those together because the exposure is going to jump. Um, you're better off using HDR, so highlight recovery or shadow recovery, which can be global to deal with those overexposed and underexposed to flatten. And then it's going to do a better job of joining those images together. Uh, and yes, Simon, uh, tilt shifts are great for panos. They absolutely are, um, which is one of the, uh, the advantages of a technical camera or tilt shift lens. Okay, um, so let's just do quickly, finally, very quickly, on to Bill's shot. So Bill, again, sent in the EIP um, of this shot here. Um, this is the RAW, and I like what you've done. There's a couple of things that just feel a little bit wrong, uh, which I'm going to cover in a second, but overall, from before and after, it's, it's a nice edit. Um, I think one of the challenges you have got for sure up on my sky layer, if I turn the mask on, so hopefully you could see it before we even turned the mask on, but you've got this area up here, which is haloing a little bit. We also have a little bit of uh, chromatic aberration up here, which we can remove if we go to this tab here. So go to your lens tab. Um, you see these green areas up here and this red area here. Um, we can also turn on a bit of purple fringing correction too. This is chromatic aberration. If I turn on my chromatic aberration option and tell it to analyze, it's going to look at the image, find all those areas, and all of a sudden, all of those bits are lessened. They won't go completely, but they're certainly going to be better than where they were before, which was bright cyan. Now, up here in this halo, let's just turn our mask on, it's simply because the mask doesn't cover that area. So what I would do, personally, is I would be a little bit more aggressive with the mask. Don't worry about the rocks, because all we're going to do is go to our luma range, and exclude anything that's dark like those rocks from the mask so just by dragging that luma range up we're now including everything that's bright all the way down to 60 slowly falling off down to 25 a soft edge so we don't notice the edge and all of a sudden we don't have that halo around the rocks so it's the right thing to do instead of trying to do hdr to do it um, to just blend in a little bit of a mask and then pull down the exposure if that was what you wanted but just make sure you do get the masking correct Okay, um, let's also look at, there was an, a slight, and, and it, to me it's just visual. There's a weirdness that happens where this is very bright and this is very dark. Um, and if I go to the before, it is exactly the case that it was, but I'm just tempted just to bring this down a little bit more. So just a, a small extra layer, um, not a lot of opacity. I'm just going to roughly draw over here. And again, it's a subtle change. We don't want to make any massive drastic changes, um, but let's just go to our exposure and just pull that down a touch just to even it up. And then overall, what I would be tempted to do, I'm just going to fill that layer. So I've created a new layer. So I'm going to call this one Left Rock. And with this one, uh, we have a filled layer, so everything's on there. We can afford, if we want to, just to pop with our curve the mid-tones up a little bit. So this doesn't increase the brightness of the highlights. We're not pushing the highlights. We're not pushing the shadows. This is the opposite of HDR. 
So in HDR, we try and pull everything into the middle of the histogram. Um, with our curve, we can pull those mid-tones brighter while leaving the shadows where they are and leaving the highlights exactly where they were too. Um, oops, sorry about the zoom. So to me, that would be the only changes that I'd make. Um, but overall, it's a good edit from where we were um, to start with. It's nicely done. Okay, guys. Um, so if there are a couple of questions, I think. Um, so Tim's, yeah, another gorgeous shot. Absolutely. Um, agreed. Um, the glitch with 21.1 or 21.01, remember, um, is the resource display uh, capture on starts and doesn't display images. Uh, lodge it as a support call, honestly, David. Um, get it get it in. I know that the guys are getting a few support calls at the moment, but get it logged, um, and then it means that you can chase it up a little bit. Um, right. Uh, Danny, the shortcuts to increase the size of the brush. Um, if you go onto Capture One site, you'll see there's a shortcut list. Um, but in general, you can do a quick adjustment to a brush. Uh, you can use the square bracket. So right makes it bigger, left square bracket make it small, makes it smaller. In new Capture One 20, you can use the um, control and option keys um, to or control shift and option keys, sorry. Um, to make changes with your brush tool with your mouse by sliding and, and so on. Um, but there's a whole list of shortcuts that you can get from the Capture One site um, and you can use it as a bit of a reference. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. Um, we will continue, if necessary, anything over on that Facebook group. Remember, next week um, we did a bit of a poll. Most people wanted to shift to Wednesday because the 24th is busy for a lot of people. Um, so we will be doing 3 o'clock on Wednesday, the 23rd, instead of the normal Thursday. And we'll look at the week after um, following that. In the meantime, remember, you've still got the option to look at the version 21 features and updates video that we did. It's about 20 minutes and it'll cover most things. Um, Danny, in terms of your question, actually, there is a um, guide that comes up on screen of all of the options for all of your keys um, to make changes to your brush. But the square bracket is the quick one for bigger and smaller. Um, and remember, you've also got all of the other um, sessions that cover clarity, brightness, uh, exposure guides and, and all that sort of stuff that you can watch for free. Um, send in new images if you want, um, send them across on that WeTransfer page, that gets directly to us, um, but remember please to include the raw file, not a JPEG, and also your name. If we don't know your name, I don't even know what folder to put your image into, and then it becomes a bit difficult. So there we go. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, and we will catch you in six days, not seven. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.